Are you ready to get into the Word this morning? Amen. I am too. Well, we're going to, uh, as we're rapidly approaching Resurrection morning, Easter Sunday, um, still talk to you about the character of Christ. Uh, last week we talked about His zeal and His compassion. And uh, isn't that who the Lord is? I hope that was an encouragement to you. Um, today, I'm going to share a few more different characteristics of Jesus on this Palm Sunday. And, um, and so I'll do less scriptures um, for each one, but focus on each one as uh, we look to um, resurrection morning, because we're going to celebrate the resurrection next Sunday. And so I want to begin with the most important that we all know, and it's why I didn't do it last week, um, but the fact that Jesus um, is a loving Savior, a loving, He's our loving God. Um, the Scripture tells us God is love, and Jesus is God. First John, or uh, not First John, just John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus is the Word, and the Word is God, and so He is love. He doesn't have love. God doesn't have love. God is love. You know, the love that we have in our own hearts um, comes from God. And it's because He's in us. He is, His love is shed abroad in our hearts. And He can love people through us in a way when we can't love in our natural selves. Anybody ever have trouble loving somebody? Is, have you ever had to work with somebody um, that just rubbed you the wrong way? It was just, it's an, an effort to be around them, to try to avoid them. Uh, anybody besides Lisa married to somebody like that? <laughs> you know, um, but love is not a feeling, love is an action. And in Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, it says this, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now this is um, it, it's amazing how it speaks to this love of God because God didn't love us when we, got, uh, when we were saved and when we started um, working on living in a way pleasing to Him as a result of that salvation. Of course, we know the salvation comes by grace through faith. There's, there's no good works. There's no cleaning your act up. No getting good enough to get saved and be accepted by God. But we all know when we were born again, we wanted to please our Savior and begin to serve Him. We were created, as Ephesians tells us, for good works. Those follow our salvation. They are the fruit of our salvation. It's, it's what a believer does. Just like when you marry somebody, you change your life. I, I used to go long distance. I used to be a long distance runner, and I used to love to run miles and miles every day. It was a time of fellowship uh, with the Lord. You know, I was in the army, and and uh, and while I was in there staying fit, I would do our PT, and we'd run the three miles we did in PT. But I led a group. We'd go early and run, not with that group, but we would run um, at least six miles. And, uh, and, and still be there for the later, uh, which wasn't late, early formation still happened. But, you know, uh, we'd gather back together after we went and showered and everything. But we would do that. And then I would go home and, and, uh, and before I got married, I'd run. But when I was in the army, I'd do that ahead because I was busy in the daytime. But I gave up my evening runs. I'd run eight miles in the evening and just, just prayer time, fellowship with the Lord. When I was uh, in high school, I'd run eight miles in the morning um, before school, uh, do a few miles, three to five miles in cross-country practice, go home, and in the evening, I'd run eight more miles at least, you know. And, and, and that was just something I used to enjoy doing. And it was a time after I got saved where it was prayer as well as that. But when I got married, it's like I can't go running and spending all this time. So I quit running, you know, in the evenings. And I got out of the army, you know. I, I, I didn't do that anymore because my priority is now for my wife and then for our daughter who came and the next child. And, and so 
we, we get that. We, we are demonstrating our love, uh, manifesting our love in some of the things that we do. We begin to put them first and not do things we used to do. That's just one example. Um, you know, uh, we go home from work, not out, you know, uh, to go out and have a meal and hang out with your friends, you know, whatever it is. Um, like you could do when you were single, um, it changes. And we see that manifested in the Lord, but he did it when we were still sinners. Nothing we did deserved the love of God. He loved us before our sin was washed away. That's amazing. But it, it reminds us of the fact that we should love others while they're in their sin. He's our role model. He loved us while we were in sin enough to even die for us. That's what Palm Sunday, going into the Passion Weekend next week, is all about. Just imagine Jesus entering Jerusalem. They thought they were having the Messiah, the King, who was going to rule the world coming into Jerusalem when they were worshiping Him. But in his first coming, he was coming to die for our sins. His second coming, he will come and set up an earthly kingdom. But they, they didn't know that. They're, they're ready to be free from the, the uh, occupation of Rome and, and just have their Messiah rule on David's throne and all of those wonderful prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. And, um, and he was coming with a focus. He was coming to die. He was coming to pay the price for our sin. He was demonstrating his love for us. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, the shame and the suffering that the cross was for him. What was that joy? You, me. To see us born again. To see us come into God's forever family. That was what enabled him to do that. Ephesians 5.1 tells us in light of this, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So just like Jesus walked in love, we are to walk in love. We're to love God and to love others. These are the... Two great commandments. It's what, uh, it, it's what our whole life should be based on. And, and, uh, and you see Jesus showing love. He was love personified. So it doesn't say Jesus loved them so much. But we all know Jesus loves us. Just by reading the Gospels and everything he did was love manifested, wasn't it? So we sing, the kids sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. But you don't find a lot of scriptures where it says Jesus loves, so, you know, love, Jesus loves us. It says God loves us and he is God. But you don't get Jesus in that. But here's one, Mark 10, 21. It says, then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Who is he talking to? The rich young ruler. Someone who is in his sin. He's religious. But he's not right with God. There's something in the way. And he's looking at, Jesus looking at him loved him and said, after he talked about, you know, doing the commandments and all of that, I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray, I give, I do all these things. And Jesus says, that's, that's great. But here's what Jesus said. One thing you lack, go your, go your way, so whatever you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come take up the cross and follow me. Now this is such a profound thing that Jesus is saying to him. Because he sees that, this, that, the, that riches have the young ruler. It wasn't just that the young ruler had riches. But riches had him. They had his heart. And so Jesus says, get rid of it all. It's an obstacle for you. Sell it, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. 
And then he says something profound. Why is it profound? You know, we don't think about it sometimes when we read this. But he said, take up your, your cross and follow me. Jesus hasn't died on the cross. They don't even understand that he's going to die, let alone on the cross and all of that. He's predicted it. The scriptures predicted it, even in the Old Covenant. But nobody's got a clue. And yet he tells him, take up your cross. Take up the cross. Follow me. Jesus is speaking prophetically, but he's speaking that live a life of sacrifice. But it's amazing because nobody had died on the... It'd be like us saying, I always you know, say it like this, um, if Jesus was living today, he might say, take up the gas chamber and follow me. <laughs> the cross, crucifixion, was the Roman form of execution. That It was so br- brutal that Rome itself later outlawed it. Because of how cruel and brutal it was. But it was their means of execution. You could say the gallows. Take up your noose and follow me. Or take up the gallows and follow me. People would be like, what? (laughs) What are you talking about? See, because there was nothing pleasant, nothing positive, nothing hopeful about the cross. That was an emblem of suffering and shame, like what we sang about this morning. But see, his whole life was focused towards that goal. And he reminds us that we're to love like he loved in a very sacrificial way. So Jesus was loving. And if we want to be like Jesus, if, we're, if we truly have Jesus in us, we are going to be loving too. Not just loving who it's easy to love, he says, talk about it. He says, it's easy. The world loves people who love them. But I'm calling you to love your enemies. Bless people who persecute you, despitefully use you. That's what we're to do. That's the God kind of love. That's Jesus. And if we have him in us, we need to allow that to go forth. And, and I, I, I'm spending a little time on this one just because it is... Love God, love others, it's everything. Do this, everything else is going to fall into place. (laughs) But I've always given this example, love is an action, it's not a feeling. I just can't love them. You're right, in the natural, in your own ability, um, we have that problem, don't we? I saw a lot of, (laughs) yeah, I know. We get it. In my own life, when I came across somebody, and I just learned this years and years, decades ago, that I was in the army, and there was a couple people in particular, both sergeants, and uh, that were over me, and so I'm interacting with them a lot, and I mean they were just so coarse and worldly and just not pleasant to be around language and what they just it just it just yuck. and I was like Lord I can't love them with my love it, it's not in me you have to love them through me I can't do it so Lord I'm asking you to love them through me now I knew that love is an action it's not a feeling I was speaking, I I don't feel it. I can't, I just, it's not there. Love them through me. So I knew in order for God to be able to do that, I had to do my part. I had to act that out, letting him love them through me. So instead of maybe trying to avoid them in one word answers and, you know, as little contact and interaction as possible, it was like when I would see them, it'd be, Good morning. How are you today? And I would mean that. You know, I want to know. How are you? And to, and to demonstrate that, they might have said, yeah, I, I remember one time they were talking about, we're going to have um, we're gonna have a big picnic this weekend. We're going to have cake.
pegs out there. We're going to do all of this stuff. Well, uh, uh, not a peg, a barbecue. We're going to have kegs out there and everything. It's like, okay, you know, not all about that. But, uh, you know, on Monday, it's like, how are you doing? How was your barbecue? Not asking about the get, you know, the beer and getting drunk and all that. But how was your barbecue? Did the, did the meat come out good? And you know, and so finding the common ground, asking them about their life, things, you know, getting to know them. And you know what happened, Jamie? As I started to act, let God love them through me by doing what Jesus would do. All of a sudden. My own love kicked in because I was seeing them different. I was doing that. And then it was like I getting like Holy Ghost goosebumps. You know, I, I still even remember it. It's like my love kicked in. And all of a sudden I see their value and that they're not awful people. And, and both of these really major, you know, examples in my own life, I, this is... How early? Because I went in the army at 17. I got saved at 16. They became my friends. I really liked them. It was letting God love them through me, but I had to act that out. I hope that helps you. I hope, you know, it's like, if you have that person, just say, Lord, it's not, I don't have it, but I have you in me. You love them through me. But you got to do your works. you got to do your acts. It's just like, you got praise in you, but you got to open your mouth <laughs> and praise the Lord. We're supposed to praise the Lord. We're supposed to rejoice before the Lord. But we have to yield to that. We have to do our part. And so, uh, so anyway, that's, that's the loving nature of Jesus. It's who He is. Not just something that He has. Oh, so-and-so is such a loving person. He is love. And so it's... We have that capacity within us. And then the other major thing, obviously, as we're approaching Good Friday, just five days away, Jesus is forgiving. It's the characteristics of Jesus. He forgives. And man, I could put all these scriptures together, but I can't. But let me read this. In Luke 23, verse 33 through 34, it says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. From the cross, a play, an emblem of suffering and shame, criminals went to the cross. The lowest of society. And he was hung on the cross between two criminals. He died for sinners, between sinners, with sinners. He had been brutalized. Not just shedding his blood, but they shamed him. They tortured him. The suffering that Jesus experienced was beyond what the normal, as, as horrible as crucifixion is, like I said, Rome itself later outlawed it. But he was scourged prior to crucifixion. And anybody that got the cat of nine tails, most of them would die in that. And not only did he have his body ripped to shreds, but they put the cross beam and had him carry his cross all the way from where he was tortured up to Calvary's hill. They put a crown of thorns on his head. I mean, I don't even like... Tony was talking about, you know, we were talking... Daniel had asked if uh, we ever... Go mushroom hunting, and I'm saying Lisa loves it. And she was saying, "Yeah, you know," because I said, "We don't know anywhere you go here." And she said, well, they have them at Galway, and Tony had mentioned yeah, they do, but you got to go through all those uh, thorn bushes to get to it—rose bushes and different thorn bushes—and it's just not worth it there. Better places to go, and 
And how many of you know? I mean, it, it, it hurts just to get stuck by a little thorn bush. I, I get hurt mowing the lawn. There's some thorn bushes, some of them on the, along this fence line that's growing through <laughs> and over the side. And once in a while, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just be bleeding. And, and it's like, ouch. But this isn't the kind of thorns that Jesus experienced. They were those old Judean thorns, long thorns, and they wrapped us around. And not only did they do that, then they took a staff, a pole, and struck him on the head and hammered it down into his scalp. He suffered. The shame, the spitting on him, the punching him in the face. Can you imagine the whole company of soldiers punching you? whether it was an open hand or a closed fist, you get a, a company. I mean, and I don't know how it was in the, in the Roman army, but in the U.S. army, we had a, a squad within a platoon, and the squad might be seven to ten people, and you have four squads in a platoon, so about 40 people, and you'd have four platoons in a company. That'd be 120 people. I don't care if you even get in slap. They're, they're soldiers. They're not giving him, you know, this light thing. They're giving him a Will Smith slap. Almost knocking you down just with one and a whole company, however many that actually was. They pulled his beard out in hand, you know. That would hurt. It would pull and make your face wrongly. This is what Jesus was experiencing, and yet he looks down at the very people who are still mocking him, still despising him, and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're blind in their sin. They're, they're blind. They don't know that they are executing God. Jesus knew it was the plan of God. It didn't take away the pain. Do you know that in that crucifixion, that when they offered him the wine mixed with myrrh, that that was to sedate people and sponge? They could soak that, not just to wet their dry mouth, but, but it, it would be you know to relieve some of the pain. And remember when he, it says that he, he takes it and spit it out and wouldn't take it? So he could endure 100%. He had to pay the full price. He had to experience it completely. No numbing it. No nothing. He suffered and died for us. And in that suffering, he says, forgive them. If he could do that for us while we were in our sin, for the very people who do, did that to him, we need to be forgiving other people. Amen? Amen? He's our model. And so uh, we need to live that way. So in Colossians 3.13, it calls us to, it says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also should do. I recommend it. No, you must do. But again, we have... Jesus on the inside. He's working on the outside. Lord, help me. I don't feel forgiving to them, but you forgive. Forgiveness is not a feeling, just like love is not a feeling. It's an action. How do you, why are you saying that, Pastor? I know that love and forgiveness, those, those are feelings. You, you feel, I feel, I just, I, I don't feel the, the grudge anymore. I forgive. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is legally separating the wrongdoing from the wrongdoer. I believe the Greek word is aphieme, and, uh, and it's the same word translated put away in the King James or divorce. Did you know that forgiveness and divorce are the same word in the Greek? You translate it into English based on the context of it. 
And what does it mean? What is to divorce? That's why they, in Old King James they say put away. You're putting them away. You're, you're separating from that person you're married to. And aphieme means to legally separate and end forever that relationship. But that same word is forgive. And so it means to send away, to cast away, to put off that wrongdoing from the wrongdoer. You're legally and forever divorcing that from them. So there's no holding it against them anymore. If I forgive you, I release you from that. I will never mention it again. I will never bring it up to you again. I won't meditate on that again. It's done. I separate that from you. And that's forgiveness. That's an action. And the feeling, just like I was describing how my love would kick in, the feeling of forgiveness that we associate with forgiveness can kick in when we're letting God's love and God's forgiveness um, to operate in our life, that can even come to where you can even have those negative feelings go away. But it'll follow the action of doing what God has called you to do. It, it, this radically changes the lives of believers who don't realize these things and live their life by saying things like, yeah, but you just don't know what they did to me. I can't love them. You just don't know what they did to me. I could never forgive them. We did a whole lot worse cumulatively than, than anything anybody <laughs> has ever done. Jesus forgave all of that. So if he can do that and tells us that we're to do it also, we have no excuse. There is no, but you don't understand. And the, and the attitude, it's not directed that way because they'll say it to you when you say, you've got to forgive. You don't understand. They're really just saying to God, you don't understand. And Jesus said, you, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. It's a part of it. If you accept in me, then I'm forgiveness. I forgave, you need to forgive also. And so we have to act on that. How do you know it's not a feeling is another example of how I say this. God tells us, how many can agree even though you don't like it? Are these some of the things for some time, once in a while, you just wish it wasn't in there? It'd, be, it'd, be, it'd, it'd make life a lot easier, wouldn't it? Thank you for the honest answers because we know it really is true whether we want to just like yeah amen that's you know i don't want to be known as an unloving unforgiving person we all have those people in our lives they've come through our life maybe it's just one or two maybe it's one or two hundred <laughs> this depends on your outlook in life a lot of times <laughs> one or two thousand everybody it's like the old guy who his wife was a practical joker, and when he was napping one day, she put some Lindberger cheese in his thick uh, mustache, and he woke up from his nap and says, Honey, calls his wife in there and says, This room smells. He walks into, out of the bedroom into the living room. He's like, Honey, the living room smells too. Goes into the kitchen to get out of the smell. It's just, the kitchen smells too. It's like, I got to get out of here. Opens the door, goes outside. And says, honey, the whole world smells. It stinks. That's the way some of us uh, are. But we're called to do this. How many of you will acknowledge the Bible tells us, it, it commands us to love and commands us to forgive. Can, can we all honestly acknowledge that? Okay, here's the deal. God doesn't command you to feel something. He's very understanding of our feelings. The feelings will often follow the obedience, the action. That's amazing. Some of you can say, I, yeah, I've been there, I, I agree with that. But the feelings will often follow that but he instructs us, he commands us 
that while they are still sinners, while they still transgress, you forgive. You love. They've done you wrong, whatever. I can't command you to feel. I always give this example. It's like a feeling is, you know, hilarious laughter is a feeling. The emotion of hilarity, right? Have you ever just seen something that's so funny? I mean, you can't stop laughing and you are crying. My wife and I, we had, I was co-pastor of a church in, in Kentucky and our, our, our pastor was up there. I'd do a devotional teaching or the sermon, usually a devotional. He was the main pastor. And then he would be up there and he got up there and he, I still see it. It's going to be hard not to laugh. He, he was preaching away and he was talking about Phoebe in the New Testament. Anybody ever remember Phoebe? And he said, Phobia. <laughs> Lisa and I both looked at each other. We're sitting on the front chair as a storefront church, a small group. So this really stood out when we did this. We looked at each other. We were able to hold it in. But then he kept referring to Phoebe by calling every time he'd say phobia. And then phobia. When we looked at each other at one point after like the third time, we just started cracking up laughing and couldn't stop. And every time we'd look back at each other, we'd do it. And he's just, cheeks are red. He's like, what? He's got this smile. He's just bewildered. What's going on? I mean, we were just cracking up laughing. It was just hilarious. Couldn't hold it in. Have you ever laughed so hard at something? Even something stupid. But there's something that happens. That's a feeling. I can't command you. In, right now, I want you to feel hilarious laughter. Experience it right now. I can't order that. Something triggers the emotion. I can't just say suddenly, Levi, I want you to experience extreme sorrow. And, and he's just going to just all of a sudden be overcome and just start sobbing back there. I can't command it. Because it's a feeling. Feelings have no morality. They're just, it's just part of us. It doesn't happen. But he commands us to love. He commands us to forgive. So it can't be a, forgive, a feeling, can it? It's an action. Feelings get attached to those actions, but they, they follow but we're commanded to just do what it says to do, whether you feel it or not. That can help a lot of marriages. You love whether you feel it or not sometimes. Anybody ever have those ups and downs? I'm holding my head down. Because some people go, this morning at the McDonald's drive-thru. Anybody ever have... I don't know. See, the next one Jesus demonstrates in his characteristics is self-control. I, I, <laughs> I like to say, I need self-control when I go to the drive-thru. It's like, okay, what's everybody want? We all know the menu at McDonald's, right? We all know the menu at Steak and Shake, Wendy's, or wherever. We, we know the menu, right? Especially McDonald's. But you go through the drive-thru, and, and when you're the driver, I don't know about you, but when you got five six cars behind you. It's like, tell me what you want so I can order it right now. I'm saying it as we're in the line. And I, I need a minute. Let me read the menu. Why? So I get up there. Can I have a minute, please? And they read the menu. Self-control. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Then Jesus said, It's written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. 
Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He goes into, he's led into the wilderness before his public ministry. This is his preparation, part of his preparation in his life. He goes into the wilderness and he fasts for 40 days. 40 nights. He didn't do a, a what do they call that, intermittent fast? <laughs> or, you know, a Ezekiel fast? Or, you know, a, a Daniel fast? Or, you know, uh, he fasted. And after 40 days, I imagine he was hungry. The fast alone was some pretty tremendous self-control. Being in the wilderness, not eating like that. And then the devil comes along and says, if you're the son of God. Now how many of you, it's easy to uh, you know, trigger our, our, our pride. You know, we want to do something. If you're the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. How many of you know Jesus, you know, he's Jesus, he, he, he can do that. But he says, no, it is written. And then he takes him and says, you know, uh, if you do this, worship me, then, you know. And, and every time Jesus says, it's written. He exercises self-control. He, he's, he was tempted in all points, all manners, just like us. So Jesus experienced temptation in his life. These are just three. But he was tempted just like all of us are tempted in life. And he had such self-control, he never sinned. <laughs> and so we see that in Jesus he controlled his desires and he submitted them to the Lord's will he's our role model we're not going to be able to live that sinless life to the degree that he did with never sinning why, he's, why he had to die for us because once we sin, the wages of sin is death, spiritual death. That's it. You're cut off. Everything about that temptation was, choose me. He even says, worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms and everything else because, you know, everybody's looking to that. Worship me. And, and he's like, nope. I submit to God and you only worship the Lord. And, but it was all about, worship me. It was all about, choose me, the God of this world, as you God, instead of God. That's what, it's, that's what it is for, for humanity. And, and, and he resisted that every time, every day, whenever temptation came his way. He had desire for food just like we have desire for food. <laughs> He had desire for, you know, he had temptations to appeal. But he would, he would go out of his way to um, not. How many times did he say, don't tell anybody? Now there were times, you've got to have the balance of Scripture. There were times he said, go and tell the good things the Lord's done for you. But there were times where he's doing some ministry and he, he, it's not about the show and and look at me, and let you know everybody admire me because of me, what I'm doing. He would say, "Don't tell anybody," so that it wouldn't, you know, cause people to wrong him because he wanted to continue to preach and teach and do some ministry there and not have that take over. It, it wasn't about him; it was about submitting his life to the will of the Father. That's Jesus, and he's our role model, so we should be. Exercising self-control in our life, uh, learning to take a, take a moment, take a breath, think about would this please God? You know, uh, again, you know, I've always talked about that the bracelets turned into just a fad, but it, the the concept of what would Jesus do <laughs> is a positive thing that that we could do and exercise some self-control, and 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 br coming from that, um, the self-control is in living separated makes him holy. And so it's different. And so I bring this out. Jesus was holy. 
He was holy. And the word holy just means dedicated or consecrated to God. Okay? Um, we're called to be holy as well. First Peter 1, 15 through 16 says, But as, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy for I am holy. In all your conduct. Not just when you go to church. And you put on the church face and the church talk. You know, or when you're around others, we're, we're, we're to be separated, consecrated. But we're to live this out. True character, we're talking about the character of Jesus. Um, character, I heard one time described as this. Character is what you do when no one else is looking. It's doing the right thing even though nobody else sees it. That's really character. That you do the right thing all the time. Not just for the show. Okay? And, uh, and so, we're to be holy all the time, every day. Think about it. What would that mean to us if we just pause and say, would, would Jesus be pleased with that? I'll tell you as I wrap this sermon up, for today we have to do communion. Um, let me uh, say to you, one way to do it for me, you know, I used to, um, I used to think about some things, you know, when temptation comes and stuff. It's like, would Jesus want, would I want Jesus, there's different ways you could do it. Would I want Jesus in here with me while I'm doing this? You know, nobody's around, you watch a movie you wouldn't normally watch. I was listening to a podcast, somebody talked about that, and you know, I thought, oh, you know, that can be a temptation for people. To just turn on something you wouldn't watch, uh, if your family was in there. But think of it like this. Would I want to be sitting here watching this with Jesus in here? Can I imagine him doing that? Can I imagine him doing that? Can I imagine him being in here while I'm doing that? And he is. <laughs> he's, he's God. He's everywhere. Yeah. But, but think about that. And I used to sometimes think, would I want the rapture to happen? Can you imagine, you know, being, you know, in some, in the middle of, committing some major sin and the rapture occurs. None of us would want to be in that situation. And that can motivate you to say, you know, rapture can happen at any moment. Imagine adultery. Remember the woman caught in adultery and, and the shame was exposed, although they didn't bring the guy, which was supposed to be brought to. That was unfair. But can you imagine being caught in the very act of that? In the rapture? It might make you change your mind about doing that. And for all the people, you know, it's like, I can't, but you don't understand what they did. Same thing, you know, as a pastor. You go, but I, I don't know what happened. I don't know how that... Right. Think about the steps that it takes to get to that point. We were at the bar. What were you doing in the bar in the first place? And, and then we started, you know, and just sat, got alone. Started. Why were you alone with her in the first place? And there's so many steps before you. I just found myself. I don't know what happened. Oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> so let's be like Jesus. Think about it. Use whatever motivation you have. As a youth pastor for years, I, I had Pastor Ray's famous dating tips and, and, you know, and all these things. And the first one was never, never. Well, don't date till you're ready for marriage was number one. Dating is to select a spouse. Now, some people say, yeah, I can learn from it. I get it. That's, but move it closer to when you're ready to marry. What's the point of it otherwise? Youth don't like it hearing that from me a whole lot, but I, I taught it throughout all the years of youth ministry. That's the number one tip. It's the best one. Because it's like an on-ramp. How many of you know we only have so much willpower in our flesh? <laughs> you get on the on-ramp, there's an off-ramp if you understand what I'm saying. You get on the on-ramp when you're 12 years old, you're 13 years old, are you going to make it till you're 21 when you get out of college or something? Then get married? No. Then you need to get that on-ramp as close to the off-ramp as possible. 
But if you're going to date, you're going to not be smart and listen to date, dating tip number one. Never, ever, ever, never, never, ever, without any exception, never, ever, never, 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 ever, 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 never, single date. Ever! That'll keep you from doing things you shouldn't be doing just there. At minimum, double date. Date amongst friends. Because you say, well, we're just, it's really a friendship. Then be amongst friends. Don't single date and put yourself in a place of temptation. And if you are rebellious and don't listen to the first two tips, and you single date, you put an 8x10 picture of Jesus or an 8x10 picture of your mom on the dashboard of your car, you get the family Bible, you know the one on the coffee table we used to have, the big family Bible, and you put that on the dashboard of the car. Try to help you. And so I have my fun with these tips. We never had a girl that was actively attending our youth ministry ever become pregnant. 11 years in Illinois. National average, statistically, that would happen the same percentage as the world. Because they weren't preaching Pastor Ray's to famous dating tips. And having a very active ministry with those teens to keep them engaged. We can do, we can live this way. Not perfectly, but boy, that's just examples of how you can exercise self-control, put some rules on your life, self-discipline, and you can be holy, consecrated, separated to God. That's what it's all about. Let's be like Jesus. He's so wonderful. Don't we want to just worship him this morning? We're going to close the sermon out in prayer, and then we'll do communion. Father, thank you so much for blessing us and just letting us be reminded of what an awesome, awesome Savior we have. Jesus, you are so you are so amazing, and we worship you. Oh, help us with the power of the Holy Spirit to live these characteristics out. We want you on the inside to live through us, and we yield our fleshly members, our bodies, to you. We consecrate ourselves to you. We separate ourselves to you. We take up our flesh. We crucify our flesh. We take up our cross to follow you, to be like you, to be able to have an impact on this world. And we do it, Lord, because we love you. We want to please you. And we thank you for this. Oh, thank you for our salvation. Thank you for Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.